Right now, today, I'm loving threads. And oh. a lot of folks, okay. exactly, they have that response. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because a lot of people looked at threads a year ago when it launched. And because it had just launched and nobody was doing anything yet because it was brand new. Today, now, if you fast forward a year later, there's over 200 million people using threads every single month. And it's surfacing content in my feed from other people. And it's refreshing. It's fun. It's interesting. It's engaging. So what is strategic marketing? Well, I love this question because it almost also begs the question, what isn't strategic marketing? marketing. And that's really the conversation I end up having a lot with businesses. They think that posting three times a week to Instagram is a strategy. And it's not. They think taking advantage of the latest trends on TikTok is a strategy. And it's not. Those are tactics. And it's important to understand the differentiation because if you don't have a defined strategy for your marketing, which includes how you're using social media and how you're showing up on social media as an individual or as a brand, then you can't possibly determine whether or not any particular tactic is right for you. So to me, it's extremely important to think about who you are as a brand, who you're talking to, and how you're going to reach and eventually convert those people. What's your biggest regret? An easy example to talk about a lot is Google+. Plus. Your listeners might not even remember Google+, Plus because it's a yeah. social network that's been shut down for nearly a decade. But in the early 2010s, that was a huge platform, hundreds of millions of users. It was a huge investment of my time. I had a quarter million followers in Google+, Plus at the moment it wow, okay. shut down. Hello everyone, this is Shubham Tiwari. I'm the Head of Content Marketing and Socials at Philo, the universal API for creator data. And I welcome you all to the second season of Impulse, Google's number one rated podcast on influencer marketing. Today we are excited to have none other than Mike Alton, as you can see. Mike is a strategic marketing leader and a fractional CMO who's passionate about empowering SaaS companies. By day, he's driving success at Agora Pulse, the top rated social media management tool. And he's also a prolific author, speaker, champion of everything related to, you know, marketing, influencer marketing, anything that you find interesting on internet, basically. Mike, welcome. Welcome to Impulse Season 2. Thank you so much, Shabam. This is going to be a blast. I know we've got a lot that we want to cover today, so I'll let you get, dive right into it. We have a lot to cover, but let's have some fun. Uh, <laughs> if you could have any superhero as your marketing assistant for a day, who would it be and why? And Homelander is not an answer. Any superhero. Well, I'm sorry, but in today's climate, I'd have to say it's Bruce Wayne. You know, some would argue he's not a superhero, but he's a billionaire. So not <laughs> only is he brilliant, he's going to be able to help me fund those ideas. And I think that's incredibly important today that, that we've got the budget to actually execute our ideas for marketing. So you're basically saying that Batman should work for you during the day. 100%. And if you could have a superpower, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Uh, my superpower would have to be a better vision of what's actually going to come in advance. So it'd be like having Dr. Strange's time crystal where I could actually see not so much campaign wise, but I'm often regretful a little bit looking back at my past and, and some of the directions I've gone, uh, not with like a specific piece of content or a campaign, but like why are why did I not lean into any particular platform or technology or approach to marketing? And obviously hindsight would, would have given me so many more options and, and insight into whether or not I should or should not have done the things that I've done in marketing. So I do have a broad background, like you mentioned, which, which can be an asset, but man, there's so many times I wish I would have just gone all in on one specific niche thing and then been able to carry that throughout my entire career. And so, yeah, having that vision Having that uh, that time crystal, oh, that'd be pretty awesome. Let's you know talk more about that. What's your biggest regret on that front? We are uh, like you know I should have predicted mm -hmm. it, or I could have gotten you know better at it had I known about it. So any specific thing you want to point out? That's honestly being very transparent. That's challenging because there are a lot. I'm thinking about a lot of the different things that I've done, directions I've yeah. chosen to go in the past that just didn't work out. An easy example to talk about a lot is Google+. Plus. Your listeners might not even remember Google+, Plus because it's a social yeah. network that's been shut down for nearly a decade. But in the early 2010s, that was a huge platform, hundreds of millions of users. It was a huge investment of my time. I had a quarter million followers in Google+, Plus at the moment it wow, okay. shut down. Um, so that was huge for me. It, it's hard for me to label it as a regret because it, I did have a huge following. I monetized that. It helped launch my career. But I also think another easy example would be during the pandemic, 
virtual events came to the fore because in-person events were completely off the table and shut down. And I've been hosting virtual events since 2018. So I already had years of experience with virtual events. And so brands and organizations started to come to me and I made a decision in mid 2020 to pivot my side business, the social media hat into virtual events. So I'm still working through for a full time. I started with them in 2018, but I've always had the side blog and the side interests. And I decided to pivot full on into virtual events. And that ended up honestly being a bit of a waste of time. I didn't generate a lot of customers or revenue. And ultimately the pandemic ended and we all craved going back to in-person again. So I don't yep. talk about virtual events at all anymore. I still do that. I still host it with Agora Pulse. But that as a decision was just one of many examples where I wish in hindsight, I hadn't have done that. I should have spent that time on AI or something else that would have far more lasting value for me personally. Yeah, you're pretty big on AI nowadays. I think you just dropped yes. another episode of your podcast on AI. I was just checking out on LinkedIn. So getting back to your expertise, one thing that you know that comes across a lot when someone visits your LinkedIn or your body of work, it's the two words, strategic marketing. And you know, in marketing, the basics are not very clear to most of the people. So what is strategic marketing? Well, I love this question because it it almost also begs the question, what isn't strategic marketing? And that's really the conversation I end up having a lot with, with businesses. They think that posting three times a week to Instagram is a strategy, and it's not. They think taking advantage of the latest trends on TikTok is a strategy, and it's not. Those are tactics, and it's important to understand the differentiation because if you don't have a defined strategy for your marketing, which includes how you're using social media and how you're showing up on social media as an individual or as a brand, then you can't possibly determine whether or not any particular tactic is right for you. So to me, it's extremely important to think about who you are as a brand, who you're talking to and how you're going to reach and eventually convert those people at a very high level. We need to be thinking about what are the kinds of pain points that they're experiencing? How are we going to talk to them? What is our tone? What is our voice? What is our style? Why are we in business? Why are we doing marketing? How are we coming across to them and resonating with those target people? That's strategy. And it's a big nebulous concept because it probably should be something that's multiple pages of written text that your organization has really wrestled with and thought about and hammered out and polished. And then finally, okay, yeah, this is our strategy. This is how we are approaching the world with who we are and what we offer you and how we can help you, our target audience. Because without that in place, brands are going to find themselves literally running and scrambling from tactic to tactic to tactic, trying to find something that works. It's, it's the old uh, saying of just throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks because yeah. you really will have no idea which noodles will stick and which noodles will fall to the ground. And you won't know why because there's no rhyme or reason to it without that strategy in place. And that strategy is going to include things like how do we know what success looks like? How do we measure success? And if we're just adopting the latest TikTok trends and seeing if the, the ice buck challenge or whatever it is that's trending yep. today will work for the brand, you're not going to know why. And, and it's not going to resonate with your audience. Right. And it's so counterintuitive that, you know, most of the marketers miss out on the very basics of marketing, right? Why, why do you think it happens? Is it because we uh, look at marketing as a static subject while it's very dynamic? We, are we not moving, you know, uh, in sync with the changing times or why or do we need to be reminded of basics, you know, from time to time? What do you think? I think it's a lot of what you just said. I think that first and foremost, I should say that everything that I just described in the previous answer, I probably made it sound easy and it's not. Developing a strategy is not easy. It's hard. And I'm not gonna say there are no shortcuts because there are, we might get into some of those shortcuts, but even then it's still challenging. You have to Think. You have to take that time to think deeply about what you want to accomplish. You have to have conversations internally and externally. You should be talking to customers all the time, particularly if you're in marketing and sales. And so that's something that has to be said from the outset. It's hard. And that's a big reason why people don't do it. If it's hard, particularly if you're already facing deadlines and you're trying to just get stuff out the door and ship whatever it is that you're trying to ship. That's, that's an impediment to you actually yep. having that time to be successful. And the other part is people just don't know. There's, there's a lot of, of misperceptions, miscommunications, and just downright bad information out there about marketing. And that's proven to me time and time again, when I ask uh, like a potential hire or someone that I might want to work with, show me a social media strategy. And they start off with, 
their frequency of posting to social media, yeah. which I'm not just making that up. That's like literally what I get 75% of the time. That tells me, A, obviously they don't know strategy versus tactics. And B, that tells me that they probably haven't been taught strategy versus tactics. And they haven't been shown what a great strategy actually looks like and how they could actually come about thinking on behalf of a different brand. How do I apply what I know? How do I take this maybe template for a strategy and mold it to fit the brand that I'm talking to or for or, or with? So there are definitely challenges there and, and it's certainly not intentional for the most part. Yeah. I don't see people you know, deliberately trying to approach marketing on a tactical basis because they think that's the best way. It's just, that's what they know and it's what they have time to do. Right. And before I come to your tryst with Agora Pulse, uh, I would like to venture into your you know, fractional CMO role, which is very fascinating. Uh, you have worked with and you still are working with various, you know, startups. What's one of the most consistent, uh, you know, marketing lessons or let's say marketing failures that you come across when you are hired as a, you know, fractional CMO? Well, it's interesting because again, I'll, I'll be transparent here. I do work full time for Agora Pulse. I have put a lot of hours into Agora Pulse. So one of the reasons why I adopted the idea that, oh, I could be a fractional CMO for somebody is what we were talking about before. I have that broad background. I have spent time working on social media, content marketing, email marketing, SEO, influencer marketing. I've, I've done courses and virtual events and, and so on. So I've had my toes dipped, so to speak, in virtually every aspect of digital marketing, which makes me a bit of a generalist. And again, this is what I thought, you know, years ago, why would I want to be a digital, a digital marketing generalist? But in today's age, that's what a fractional CMO is. That's somebody who understands every aspect of digital marketing to some extent or another and can step into another business and help them come up with that strategy that we've been talking about and toiling around this entire conversation. So all that's to say, I don't work with a lot of businesses. I mean, I work with very, okay. very few. Most of the time, I don't have an active fractional CMO role with the business because it's, it's so part-time for me. It's the kind of thing where just once in a while, if the right business comes along and the opportunity is there and the timing is right, then we could talk about working together. And generally speaking, to get back to your, your question, the biggest issue I see is, yeah, they don't really have a cohesive strategy. They haven't taken the time to identify who they are as a brand, like why they are as a brand. Most brands have a history, right? They know who started them and when and where and that yeah. kind of factual stuff, like a Wikipedia entry, but they haven't taken the time to define their why. Why did they actually create the processes and the features and functions that they did? Why are they so obsessed? A point, because it's not all the features of every product. It can't be, right? But there's one or two things that every product that they do really, really well, and they're obsessed with doing those things well, and they're obsessed with helping their customers. Why? Why is that? And the reason I stress that is because until you identify what that why is, this is a very Simon Sinek approach to, to, to marketing, by the way. Once you identify that, then it's something you can literally talk about. And it's something that every single person that you're helping will relate to. But if you haven't done that, then your marketing copy is going to fall flat and your strategy is going to fall flat. So that's typically what I end up doing. Uh, we might have like a workshop or a working session where we've got key members of, of, the, uh, uh, of the other business on the call and we're, we're workshopping our why as a brand. Right. And then we're workshopping, okay, great. How do we inject that into all the things that we're doing? Our blog posts, our sales copy, our landing pages, our events, right? I mean, if you've got a why that exists, for instance, to, to help brands wrap their heads around influencer marketing and actually get amazing results working with external influencers, that's terrific. How are we talking about that? In, in, our, in our sales copy. How are our sales uh, folks actually getting excited about that? And that honestly was a very lame why. You guys can come up with a far better why for why you guys do what you do. Um, that's, that's a lot of what I do with brands. Right. Do you think in order to be a successful influencer marketer, you have to be a generalist to some extent like you? Would no, that help? No, absolutely not. Just to clarify, someone who's working with the influencers or someone who's actually an influencer? Someone who wants to work with influencers, let's say a brand manager. Then you definitely need to have a broad understanding, but you don't necessarily have to broad experience. So by that, I mean, you should understand email marketing and content marketing 
but nine times out of 10, you're going to be working with an influencer who the bulk of their influence is on social media. And that's probably where your strength is going to be. But if you're going to work with an influencer on an omni-channel campaign, you need to have at least a base understanding of what that means when I say omni-channel, right? Because like if someone was working with me as an influencer, I'm, I'm an influencer, right? My yep. channels include my website, my blog, and my social media and my email newsletter. My email newsletter is arguably my strongest channel with over 40,000 subscribers who've been there for many of them years and years and years. So if as a brand's coming to me and working with me, they're gonna wanna understand that and be able to appreciate that. Okay, Mike's got a podcast. What does that mean? We're not gonna necessarily look at downloads because we want impact from a podcast episode. Those are the kinds of things that, yeah, if I'm working with another influencer, I'm talking to them about where are their channels? I doubtless found them on social media and doubtless found them on a very specific social channel because we're a social media management company. And so that's the first thing we're looking at. If we want to do a campaign about our TikTok support, yep. we're going to look for TikTok influencers, right? People who've built a following on TikTok specifically about how they're helping other people with TikTok. It's very meta. Um, but we're also going to have a conversation with them. Have you built a community? Do you have an email subscriber list? Do you have a blog? Do you use it? Not everybody does. Uh, so those are things to think about and try to leverage if you can. Great, great points for a brand manager. Now coming to your experience, uh, your chief storyteller at Agora Pulse and your you know association with them has been evolving. So can you give us an overview of what you do at Agora Pulse nowadays and where Agora Pulse as a company is headed to? It's definitely been an evolution. It's been a journey for me. When I first started in 2018, I was one of our first 10 random brasters. At the time, we were all being managed by the CEO and he recognized early on that he wasn't managing us because... He's the CEO. We didn't have time for that. And so he brought me on to manage and grow the influencer marketing program, our brand ambassador program at Agora Pulse, which is what I did for years. And then I took on affiliates and then I took on brand partnerships. And I was running our events and because I was running our virtual events and I knew all the influencers and I was going to the event, the in-person events and conferences in the industry, I ended up running our in-person booze and that sort of thing. And over time, we recognized many things, one of which was that that was too much. I was just way too much for one person. And recently, we recognized yet another need inside the company, which was that we don't have anybody or didn't have anybody focused on storytelling. We didn't have anybody who was obsessed with the quality and the quantity of the stories that we were telling. We've been telling stories for years, but it's been a very haphazard approach, right? We would release a case study. Maybe somebody approached us and we thought, oh, wow, that's a really interesting story. It's a fantastic use of our product. We should tell that story. Maybe we approached them, but there wasn't a framework. There wasn't any kind of quality control over whether or not that was a really, really good story or not. Again, being transparent, we've published some case studies that we shouldn't have. Those weren't great stories. Maybe the story itself was really cool, but as a case study, maybe that wasn't actually the kind of audience we're trying to talk to, which is an important point. I mean, this goes back to the strategy part where every business should understand who they're trying to talk to. Now, I'll give you a silly example. As a social media management tool, we're not selling to one-room schoolhouses. Those barely exist anymore. But just as a silly example, right? We're not selling to one-room schoolhouses. But yet if a one-room schoolhouse came to me yesterday with a story about how amazing their experience with Agora Pulse was, I should have the wherewithal to look at that and say, that's pretty cool. Maybe we could talk about that on our social channels, but I'm not going to invest resources and time into building that as a case study because my sales team will never use it. They're yep. not selling the one room schoolhouses. So that's a big part of my role today now is helping the entire company understand what makes for a good story and what are the qualifications and channels and ways that we tell stories. And then most importantly, talking to everybody in the company about these things, because the truth is everybody in the company is a storyteller. It's not necessarily part of their title. It's not a part of their day-to-day -day role, but it comes up with every single person in the company at some point. And I don't care if they're product or customer success or sales or marketing. At some point, they're going to be talking to somebody and there'll be an opportunity for them to share a story if they've been given that information or an opportunity to recognize that the person talking to them is sharing a great story and they're going to want to know what to do with that next. And, and that's a big part of my job. Right. You're clearly very passionate about storytelling and I see many books behind you as well. I usually ask this question at the end of the you know interview, but give us your top two or top three storytelling books. Oh, I love your books as well. Please talk about your books as well. Oh, I'm not going to talk about my books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about Mira Rodriguez. She wrote the book Brand Storytelling and it has been my guiding truth 
right now because wow. I am passionate about storytelling and I've been doing storytelling for a while. It obviously hasn't been officially part of my title or role until very, very recently. And that's because we had to address this gap, this, this lack of knowledge and, and guidance in the company. So a big part of what I'm doing this quarter, Q3 2024, is like I said, identifying what makes for a good story. How do we build that out? What's the framework? What's the process? And that sort of thing. So I'm trying to figure that all out and document it for the whole team. And Mary's book is an absolute treasure trove of that, exactly what I needed to know. She identifies, for instance, different ways that you can tell stories. I mean, if you've never really thought about it, you might not realize there's a lot of different ways that you can tell stories, but there are. And you may or may not want to use them all. Most of us are probably familiar with the hero's journey because uh, yep. that's been almost codified in our culture. We see it in our movies yeah. and that sort of thing. That's not the only way. Maybe it's the best way. Maybe it's the best approach. But a lot of that depends on the use case. If we're talking about a, a case study where we want a prospect to see themselves in the shoes of one of our existing customers, see themselves achieving the same kind of success that that customer already achieved, where we were helping them along the way. Well, then, yeah, that's, that's classic hero's journey. But if we also want to share a story about our why and give you a behind the scenes look at why we released a particular feature, I might want to incorporate interviews from different product engineers and customer success team members who've actually talked to customers and they identified that we really need to do this. And then they took that to product and product said, yeah, we really need to do this. And they took it to the engineers and the engineers really did it. That's a different kind of story. There's no hero's journey there. There's a framework specific for that kind of story that I might employ. So yeah, her book, Brand Storytelling, long, long winded answer to that question. That's it's literally on my desk. I'm looking at it right now because I'm, I'm referring to it over and over again and going back to parts of it. And again, using it as my guiding light for this part of my career. Wonderful. We'll certainly put a link of the book and your books as well in the description of this uh, <laughs> interview, because you may not talk about your books, but we will certainly. So yeah, coming to, you know, the second part of my previous question. So Agora Pulse is known for its powerful social media management tool. So my question was where it's headed now, new features you can talk about or anything that you're building. One of the things that we're doing right now not that we've never listened to customers, but we're paying even closer attention today to what customers are struggling with and what they're asking for help with. Because today's marketing landscape, and I, I always like laugh internally when I use terms like marketing landscape, but today things are complicated. They are changing more rapidly than ever, thanks to AI. And there's also these economic and macroeconomic issues that are really, really pressuring our clients, whether they're businesses or agencies who are working on behalf of businesses. So we're doing everything we can to try to make their roles easier and more successful. So for instance, uh, we've completely revamped how we approach social media listening and come out with an entirely new way, streamlined, more powerful, more dynamic ways for our customers to listen on social media, to the conversations that matter to them and to their customers. We're paying attention to artificial intelligence and we're looking for more and more ways that we can bring artificial intelligence to the fore, not just in terms of like being able to say that we use AI, but how can we actually use AI in a way that helps our customers? So here's a fun story for you. Okay. Last year, we released an artificial intelligence feature where we just built it into our composer, where you're using Agora Pulse to post to social media. You have to compose the social posts. And so you typically would put in your copy when you, you would choose which channels to share that to Facebook, X, and so on. Well, we introduced a feature where using AI, generative AI, it'll take a look at whatever you put in the composer and then spin and change and manipulate that text to make it funnier, more stochastic, wittier, more professional and so on. And there's all these different permutations that you can do with the text. And we thought, yeah, that'll make it easier for social media professionals to create better social media content. But then I was talking to the digital marketing department director at WSU Tech last week. And we were talking about how she's using, using Agora Pulse in the classroom. And she shared this story with me where she's got a student who isn't a native English speaker. And she's being tasked to create copy for social media posts. And she struggles okay. with humor and sarcasm. Yep. She, can, she can be funny in her native language. I don't know what that was. Yeah, yeah. Time, but translating into the English, she, she was really struggling with that. She's not only being graded on the social media copy that she's trying to create, she's actually working with real life clients. That's one of the beauties of the program that they have there. They've got this basically an agency owned by the college that works with actual businesses in Kansas. 
And she's trying to create copy that they're hoping and expecting their real businesses will take that and use it. But then they discovered our AI writing tool. And she was able to put in the details of what she wanted to communicate in the post and use wow. the AI tool to actually turn that into really great English copy. And so they were just floored when they were able to do that. And, and that's allowed her to be successful as, both as a student and as a real-time marketer. Those are the things that we hear about and that really excites us. Like, okay, right. Let's, how can we double down on that? How can we make it even easier for people to create great social media content? The other thing that we do is we're applying AI to help them understand the reports and the metrics that they get, which is a brilliant use of AI. For those of you listening, if you're not yet applying AI to your data and helping you translate the data, the graphs, the analytics, the reports that you're seeing, you're missing out because it's powerful. And eventually we want to be able to have it so that you can just have a conversation with the AI about what you're seeing in the graphs. You see a spike, you can be like, okay, why Why do we have that spike? How does that relate to our campaigns and our initiatives? What else was going on that day along all of our other channels? That's what excites us. And that's the direction we're going with, with Agora Pulse. Wonderful. So you're enabling a lot of people with this uh, new feature. So Agora Pulse is clearly headed in the right direction, as I asked in the question. Uh, speaking of directions, uh, if you could redesign any social media platform, today, which one would it be? And what changes would you make to it? Well, I'll, I'll phrase this in a very positive way, because I, I, I could go very negative about some of the existing platforms. But to, to put yeah. it from a positive perspective, right now, today, I'm loving threads. And oh. a lot of folks, okay. exactly, they have that. Response. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because a lot of people looked at threads a year ago when it launched, and because it had just launched, and nobody was doing anything yet, because it was brand new. There wasn't much there. There wasn't a lot of activity there and the algorithm wasn't working. Today now, if you fast forward a year later, there's over 200 million people using threads every single month. There are plenty of people using threads. And that means there's plenty of content for the algorithm to understand who you are, Shupam, who I am, Mike, what I'm interested in. It's looking at what I'm posting about. It's looking at how I'm engaging with other people and it's connecting with me and it's other people and it's surfacing content in my feed from other people that I wouldn't have otherwise seen or been engaged with. And it's refreshing, it's fun, it's interesting, it's engaging. And I would just love to see now more of the traditional features that we would come to love and almost expect from a social network like insights, like more uh, fine grained control over who I see in my feed. It's great to see new stuff, but I'd also like to be able to flip a switch or a toggle and see, well, you know, what are my friends? saying, you know, how can I refine that like lists, uh, being able to post other kinds of content a little more easier and see different like video formats and that sort of thing in the in the thread. So I'm loving threads and I'm just excited about how they're going to continue to develop as a platform. And I'm sure they're working on everything that I just mentioned. Right. You mentioned thread. Uh... I think I need to get back on it and for start following you because like all the people, most of the people, not all, I installed it, kept it for seven days and I got rid of it. But yeah, I mean, a lot of content coming in. And speaking of content, what's your tip for uh, consistently creating valuable and engaging content? I know these are very broad terms, valuable and engaging, <laughs> but what do you think? My number one tip is focus on long form content first, preferably video first. That video first strategy will be so powerful, particularly if you're a brand where maybe you're a smaller team and you don't have an entire marketing department. Maybe there's like three people in marketing or maybe it's just you and you're struggling to create content for all these different channels, all these different kinds of content. If you focus on long form content first, particularly video first, then you can empower every single other thing that you want to do. Every other channel, every other kind of format, a video because you know this video interview is a perfect example right this is going to be a 30 45 15 minute video so already you're going to have a long form blog post and a long form youtube video and a long form podcast but yeah. then you can take that and you can repurpose and take snippets out of there and i can literally give you 96 different ways and i'm not exaggerating 96 wow. different ways that you could take this one single 45 minute recording and spin that out just as an easy example, I am sure in this 45 minutes, one or both of us have said something really engaging and really interesting that is 60 seconds or less. And if you can find that 60 second clip, which it doesn't sound like much, but in reality, that's going to be several sentences, several paragraphs of information. So you could you can actually deliver quite a lot of value in 60 seconds. And if you can find just one 60 second clip, now you got a piece of content that you can share to TikTok, Instagram Reels, Facebook Reels, YouTube Shorts, Pinterest and now LinkedIn. I mean, we're talking about all these social platforms. LinkedIn's now form 
favoring vertical video. So start sharing yep. those vertical video clips to LinkedIn and X. That's seven channels, seven posts with one 60 second clip. And again, this is a 45 minute conversation. You'll probably be able to find several. I do a podcast on my own, my AI marketing podcast. And that's typically anywhere from 25 to 45 minutes in length each time. And I always find one 60 second clip that I'm going to use as the introduction to that yep. episode. So that's the first thing people hear is the guest saying something super impactful for 60 seconds. Then we roll in the intro and we start over. And that's the first clip that I shared to every social channel, but it never fails. I'll find two, three or four other clips that I, I put into a folder and I start to drip those out over time in addition to quotes and graphics and all the other things. So there's so much that you can do, but it only it only works well if you start with that long form video first. Yeah, clearly. 96 is a very enticing number for me. So I'll clearly you know, check out all the things. How do you balance the need for data-driven decisions? Because you're very passionate and very meticulous about it with the creative aspect of marketing, because a lot of people struggle with it. They just are keeping up with the demand. So no time for creativity. So how do you maintain the difference? Well, I'll start by saying just like work-life balance, there isn't such a thing as a data and creatively creativity mm -hmm. balance. Because when we say balance, people think, oh, it's going to be equal on both sides and even. And no, that's not the case. It's more like a pendulum where some days, some weeks, some quarters, some campaigns, you're going to have a lot of data and that's going to help inform you and give you deep insights. And, and other times you're going to be really on the creative side and really focused on that because maybe you don't have a lot of data. Maybe it's your first time doing something of this kind. And an example might be starting a TikTok channel or creating an ebook, you know, or working with an influencer. You're right. If you've never done that before, what data could you possibly rely on other than other people's data? And you're going to have to take that with a grain of salt. So you often have to start with creativity. But then once you execute for a while and you start to build a library of data that you can then go back and look at and see, all right, what are the trends that I can pull out? From that was it an influencer that worked well was it an approach was it a topic uh and again this is where ai can be particularly helpful if you can pull all that data into a spreadsheet or something and then just literally just paste that into chat gpt then you get to have a conversation with the data analyst that's free or 20 bucks a month who can actually say you know what i noticed out of those all those campaigns and all those influencers that you worked with on that campaign last quarter you know here's two trends here are two i shouldn't say trends here are two topics that seem to really resonate that might be something you want to double down on on next quarter. So you you do that and you have to have that back and forth where, right. all right, we use some data, whatever data we can to inform our next decisions. And then we carve out time to try to be as creative as we can about what it is that we've been told we should lean into. Is it a particular topic? Okay, cool. How can we creatively approach that topic again next month, next quarter? Do we use different influencers? Do we tap different channels? Do we, uh, you know, come up with different ad copy? Uh, you know, different graphics, different videos. Um, how do we talk about it? The same thing in a new and innovative way. That's where the creativity comes into place. So to me, it's not a balance at all. Right. Speaking of your different avatars, uh, you've been speaker, uh, speaker at numerous events, right? What's the most memorable question you have been asked by an audience member? Okay. The most memorable question I've been asked by an audience member. Yeah, I've talked about influencer marketing. I've talked a lot about content marketing. I think the one we touched on is the one that probably comes up the most often, which is how do I repurpose the content that I'm creating and make it more and more valuable? And, and this was often coming up from a blogging perspective because I used to teach people blogging and content marketing. And I've, I've kind of leaned away from that because people don't like to write. And no matter how many tips and, yeah. and tactics I give them and how, no matter how much I pound the why, I can't make you love to write yeah. if you dislike it. And there were many people that I would talk to that would hate to write. And I'm like, ah, oh, that really just burned my soul to have people tell me that, but it was true. And I, I had to appreciate that. And so then we would talk about how to use video the way that I mentioned before, right? If you don't like to write, okay, great. Do you like to talk to a camera? Are you that kind of an extrovert? Do you like to talk to other people? Can you do that? Can you do an interview show or something like that? And use that to power your content marketing. And so that's a big part of where my presentation, how to create 10 times more content, 10 times faster came from. I'd give them all the basic information about great content marketing strategy. And then at the end, we would talk about how to take a Facebook Live or a LinkedIn Live or an interview like this 
and repurpose it and turn it into truly epic content. Because if you can do this and you can do it well, this being, you know, interviewing other people, yeah. it can really catapult your content marketing and therefore your website's success because there's been studies done and, and they've repeatedly shown that as a business, you will start to see your traffic and then your leads and then your revenue increase at exponential rates once you hit 50 pieces of content on your website. We're talking okay. about solid pieces of content, not like 250 character posts, but like 500, 750, 1250 or more characters, long form content. Once you hit about 50 on average, that's when businesses really start to see exponential increases in traffic. And that's because Google now understands, all right, I see what you guys are talking about here. I'm going to start sending you more traffic. And right. hopefully you've been consistent throughout that time. That's kind of a caveat there that we're not talking about 50 different topics. It's a short, small collection of three to five topics that we're talking about from various angles each and every time. And then you also start to develop that, that authority online. And now you've armed your marketing team and your sales team with at least 50 assets that they can use in everything that they're doing. So once you get to that plateau, everything really starts to gel and it becomes so much easier if you're just you're using video from the start. So just, I'm a bit of a broken record here because I think we're, we're talking around the same kinds of topics where I really, really strongly believe if you do long form video first, whether it's solo or interviews or a mix, that's going to empower everything else that you want to accomplish. And, and that's the kind of thing that comes up often when I'm talking to people about content marketing. There you go. We got one of our, you know, 60 second clips out of this answer right there. Speaking of questions, uh, what I try to do, you know, with this podcast is sometimes sneak in a question or two related to, you know, the things I'm working on and I'm trying to researching on. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is, uh, what is the difference in the top of the funnel marketing for SMB and for enterprise clients? Maybe let's give it context of influencer marketing. Wow. That is a deep question. And I appreciate that you're coming to me with that. It's kind of the way that I approach podcasts as well as I'm asking my guests the questions that I want answered to be honest. Yeah. I, I often, I literally say my introduction, I'm picking their brains. But so we're talking about top of funnel. So that's going to be conceptually the same, both SMBs and enterprise. Top of funnel is, means it's all about awareness. But I think a big part, a big difference that I see off the top of my head would be tone. If you're talking to SMBs, your tone is going to be very different than if you're talking to enterprise. And I also think then the next steps would be very different. If I'm talking to SMBs, top of funnel, that's my focus as a brand, small to medium businesses. Typically speaking, the budgets are going to be smaller. The sales cycle is going to be shorter. The number of people that I'm going to have to talk to are going to be far fewer. Typically, the decision maker is probably the person who's consuming the top of funnel content. Enterprise is very different. Top of funnel for enterprise looks like I'm talking to one person, hoping that they get me into the door so that I start to talk to the six other people I'm going to have to talk to in the sales cycle and journey before I finally get to the decision maker at the end of that journey, which took me six to nine months. It's very different. And so the material is different, right? Not just the subject matter, but how we're approaching it. It's got to be far more advanced. It's got to be more data driven. Um, Case studies are great, but even the case studies are going to feel and look different than when I'm talking to an SMB audience. Right. Yeah. So I really just think it's, it's the look and feel that's, that's different more than anything. Right. You've authored the ultimate guide to social media marketing. I told you we talk about books at the end of this interview. So, <laughs> and since you're not talking about your books, let me. What's one piece of unconventional advice from the book that you swear by? Because earlier you mentioned that most of the marketing jargon that is available on social media out there, it's not really helpful, right? You mentioned Simon Sinek and something like that. So unconventional wisdom from you, from the book. Well, I appreciate the question. It's not that I don't want to talk about my books or, or other materials. It's that I don't want to talk about them just for the sake of talking about them. But in this yeah. case, you asked the question. So uh, the book, The Ultimate Guide to Social Media Marketing, was actually a, a collaborative effort between me and several other co-authors. It was published by Entrepreneur Press. And one of the really, really valuable lessons that I tried to impart there, and this will be appropriate to you because it's about influencer marketing, was that I stressed how important relationships are. And while I was talking about influencer marketing, this honestly applies to every aspect of, of marketing. The relationship that you have, in this case with the influencer, has got to be paramount. That's the first thing you're trying to develop. You don't just want to identify an influencer and reach out and say, hey, Joe, can I pay you 50 bucks to send out a social post? That's not going to do anything for you. Yeah. It's just going to waste your money. You know, yeah, maybe he'll do the post. Maybe he won't. If, it, if he's a macro or mega influencer, he's going to laugh at you. Um, but since there's no relationship there, 
there will be no authenticity whatsoever in Joe's post to social media. His True. audience will not buy that he has any vested interest other than a paycheck for sharing what it is that you're asking him to share. But if you've taken the time to develop a relationship, and that means following, connecting with the influencer, engaging with their content, watching how they engage back with you, two things are gonna happen. The first thing is hopefully you do develop a relationship with them and, and you and Joe start to have real conversations about your industry and about your business. And Joe takes a real interest in what you do and the solutions that you offer and literally wants to work with you. And then you wanna work with him. The second thing that'll happen is you'll come to understand Joe's worldview. And this is critically important. You don't want your brand today aligned with an influencer that doesn't share your values, that doesn't share the values of your target audience. And when I say values, this doesn't necessarily have to mean religious values or political values or anything like that, but we all have values, things that are important to us. And even from a business perspective, and we've seen time and time again, so many brands burned when they work with an influencer who they have their own values and they're free to talk about their values and the things that are important to them with their audience. But if that's not aligned with the business, all of a sudden now the business is seeing backlash and yep. problems, PR problems, because well, they tied their brand to that influencer. And you might think it was just one post that you paid for, but oh, no, no, hey, listen to me. When, when that influencer talks about your brand, even if it's just once, now there's a connection in the audience's mind, good, bad, or indifferent. And so when you pay attention to how that influencer conducts themselves on social media, you get to know their values, get to know the world, but you get to know how they treat their audience and you get to actually understand their audience a little bit better. When they post to social media, how many people are actually engaging? with that post? How are they engaging with that post? Is the influencer responding to each and every you know, commenter on that post? And what's the tone and the style of those responses? Those are the things that you can only determine if you take a little bit of time and you work on developing a relationship with each individual influencer that you wanna yep. work with. So that's the point that I really hammered home or tried to in the book. It's a, there's a whole chapter on influencer marketing. I encourage you to read that and study that. And I, I think that's really one of the most important lessons I could convey. Right, it's a great segue into my next question. Uh, speaking of relationship building, how can you know API companies like Philo help or add value to you know companies like Agora Pulse or whoever is trying to enable the creator economy system, influencer marketing system? It's a really interesting question because a lot of it is thinking about what doesn't yet exist. And this is actually a topic I come up with and talk about a lot in my AI Marketing Impact podcast, because this is something humans are not actually very good at. We're not good at seeing what's not there. We're not good yep. at imagining really what could yet be accomplished if it hasn't already been done. And, and so that's the pitfall too, with brands and Agora Pulse, we're, we're just as guilty of that. If we're talking to another company, too often we rely on, well, what have we already done? What have we done in the past? How have we integrated? How have we co-marketed? How have we partnered? And so the challenge and the beauty and the real opportunity is in taking the time to have a frank and open conversation and explore what hasn't anybody else ever done? How could we work together? Maybe it's an integration, maybe it's a collaboration, co-marketing webinar or something, you know, and even webinar gets used a little bit too much because, oh, let's just go on a webinar and talk about what we do. That's not gonna be interesting or engaging. But if we could come up with a way that our two tools could be used together. And this is true, again, for any brand listening. And honestly, if you're listening right now, take the word brand and API out of what I'm saying and insert business, insert influencer, insert neighbor. There are so many ways that all of you interesting listening could collaborate with other brands, other influencers, other partners, whether there's a technical integration there or not, that brings together that better together story that's just so powerful when, when brands are able to leverage that, that brings together that opportunity to do something bigger than who we are as individuals. So right. influencers, if you're listening to this, you know, one of my favorite things for influencers to do is to collaborate with each other on behalf of another brand. Most brands don't do this because they don't think about it, but I've seen Adobe do it and we've started to do it at Agora Pulse and it just exponentially increases the value of the campaign and the camaraderie that happens with the influencers and the brand. It's a super powerful way to proceed. And this is why I was all about partnerships for so many years, because this is the best way to exponentially grow each other's brands is to work together. So yeah, I love looking for ways that brands can collaborate or integrate that's new 
and different. So that's what right. I want to do is and, and explore. Wonderful. So it's about uh, collaboration, relationship building, being AI, uh, you know, let's say if you, even if you're not AI native, being, you know, aware of where the things are going, being data driven and for, you have to care essentially if you are into the relationship building, you know, business. So thank you so much, Mike Alton for coming to the show. One last ritual we make our guests go through. Would you like to nominate anyone for our show? Well, yes. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> Too many was people. <laughs> so now I got to think about it. Who would be really great for this show? So we're talking about influencers. I'm just going to kind of externally process this. So yeah. forgive me, those of you listening. Uh, we're talking about influencer marketing, influencers, relationship building. You know, Jessica Phillips is the first person that comes to mind when I say relationship, and I think she'd be fantastic. She runs an agency in a middle town in Ohio called Now Marketing Group. And more important than that, she's had at the fore of her career since she started the importance and the power of relationships. And so she literally teaches businesses, brands, influencers, how to focus on relationship marketing. She's been a dear friend and colleague for years. I think she'd be a terrific guest. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we are really glad that we could be a part of the narrative journey of your career. Uh, so... Thanks again. And to everyone watching, if this was helpful, please let us know, like, share and subscribe and follow Mike Alton on LinkedIn or wherever you are. Yeah, more power to creators and to those who are helping creators. Thank you so much. Impulse, the influencer marketing podcast is brought to you by Philo. Philo is the easiest way to get access to authenticated creator data from hundreds of different platforms. To know more about Philo, visit getphilo.com. That's get p h y l l o.com. Also, make sure to search for Influencer Marketing Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast listening platforms. And don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Philo, thank you so much for listening.